Hello, and welcome to Financials Podcast Future Rich. I'm your host, Barbara Ginty, and I'm also a CFP. And I am here with my advisor friend, Sarin. Hi, Sarin. Hey, Barbara. How are you? Good. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, I'm excited to be on your podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think it's so important to get another perspective of the industry and this career path from another successful female advisor so that they're not always just hearing my perspective because obviously with personal finance, it is not black and white. And so I love bringing on other perspectives. Well, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the financial services industry in general, specifically about our role as advisors. So I definitely think it's a topic worth getting into. We won't even cover it in today's podcast. It's so multi-layered, in my opinion. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. Well, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about your background and where you're located, and then we'll kind of dive into it. Yeah, sure. So my office is located in Burlington, Massachusetts, which is probably 20 minutes or 30 minutes outside the city of Boston. I have been in the industry since I graduated college, which I feel like is an exception to the rule in and of itself. So I started my career over at Ameriprise Financial. Um, I was there for around four years and I really got a good taste of what it feels like to be in the in the industry because the 07, 08 market bubble burst. So that was really fun to be, you know, yeah. two years in two years into the industry. I could talk about that for an hour in and of itself. Uh, And then I switched over to LPL Financial, which is an independent broker dealer over in 2009. And I've been there ever since. Amazing. So how many years do you have in the industry at this point? 19 years Mm now. Oh, wow. So yeah. So you've been doing this quite some time. Yeah. And what was the reason you decided to go into this career path? Because as I talk about in the podcast, well, they don't actually have true statistics because no one there's to keep the data, which is a bit disappointing, but it varies from what you read somewhere between 15 and 20% of the industry are female advisors. Well, actually uh, a lot of my influence about coming into the financial services industry was my dad. I graduated college uh, from Boston University and I went to the business school. And when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I think he had read an article, honestly, in Consumer Reports, his favorite magazine. And it was one of those like top 10 jobs and financial advisor was one of them. And he's like, you should do this. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't, I had done accounting and I loved accounting in the sense of I was solving problems, mm-hmm. like and loved balancing everything out. But I had worked in an engineering company in their accounting department for a couple of years and it was just so boring because there was no interaction. So what I did was I set up a bunch of informational interviews with financial advisors that worked at different places. And in those interviews, I realized that actually being a financial advisor was the best of both worlds for me. What it allowed me to do was the problem solving piece that an accountant does, but working with individuals and each client that comes to us, the problem solving is a little different. The solutions are a little different. That's how it came to be. Uh, You know, I was fresh out of college and people said that you don't know what you're doing. No one's going to trust you with your money. You should go work somewhere and get some training. And at the time, Ameriprise had a really robust training program. So off I went. Yeah. So I was going to say, I think training is like a really important thing in our industry, obviously, because the stakes are high. What was the hardest part about, did you find coming into the industry? Was it like all the exams you have to take or the practical knowledge that you also have to have? No, what no one told me, and I wish like I knew from a perspective was you can get licensed and call yourself an advisor, but you're not really an advisor until you have clients. So really- (laughs) That's a very good to distinguish that. You're correct. You have to have clients to really be an advisor. You have to have clients. So you really are a marketer the first couple of years. At Ameriprise, we had phone clinics. We were doing trade shows. We were doing home shows, lunch and learns, like just anything and everything to get in front of people to be able to set an appointment and get a client. Yeah, you're right. That is probably the hardest part. Um, And there are uh, various ways to be in this industry. And one is to be on your own and independent where you have to go get all of your own clients which is actually the hardest part of the business. And the reason I think 90% of advisors fail in that role when they have to go get their own client, because it is really hard to take someone from meeting them to getting them to be a client. That is, I think, probably one of the hardest things to learn. Particularly as a baby faced. Yeah. As a 20 something year old. You know, like with no personal experience in finance, that was definitely not something I was prepared for. You know, I was like, oh, I'm going to be a financial advisor. You know, like I only feel like a financial advisor now, Uh, not the first. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. It takes a while to ramp up. And then how did you transition to going out on your own? That's a very different scenario than like working for a firm and 
on just saying, because yeah. you have multiple roles when you own your own business. You're a business owner and you're a financial advisor. So you're wearing definitively two hats. It wasn't a decision I made. It was something I was kind of forced into. Uh, so what oh. ended up happening was I knew when I joined Ameriprise, I was only going to stay for a few years just to get the training. And right. I didn't want to stay there. That I eventually wanted to go independent. And then obviously 07, 08 market occurred. So now I'm three years into it. And then 2009, two um, older advisors that I worked with at Ameriprise had left to join LPL in a group office and they recruited me to that office. And I came over to LPL, joined this group office and long story short, it wasn't a good fit. The way it was sold was very different than what was actually in practice. I was like, okay, this is not a good fit for me. What are my options? Like I'm already here at LPL, which is an, in, you don't have a choice. Like at Ameriprise, you could be a W-2 employee or you could be an independent. At LPL, there is no option. You either work in a group practice with other advisors or you have your own business. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't know anyone else at the time. I had to really dig deep and kind of think like, is this it? Is this the end of the road for me? Like, do I just go and, and work at another office? But ultimately I couldn't walk away from the client kind of relationships that I had built. And I was young enough at the time. I was 26 years old. And you had your own clients at that point. I had my own clients. Yep. I figured, okay, if at any point I'm going to try and fail, this is it. And mm -hmm. there's really not, I, I don't have a lot of responsibilities. I don't have kids. I'm not married. Let me give this a shot. Yeah, the rest is kind of history, as they say. Wow. Okay, so it kind of like happened to you. If you it know. happened to me. It wasn't a yeah. conscious decision of, oh, I'm going to go start my own business financial advisory firm. It was, I just kind Make of Make a decision. To. Yeah. And obviously you like it because you're still in it. <laughs> obviously, correct. Yes. <laughs> the only job I've ever had. How many people do you know that can say that? I mean, I can't. I've had multiple. <laughs> Right out of college. Only job I've ever had. Um, you know, we brought in another very successful advisor and she's the same way. She started right after college and she's been doing it for a very long time, also independent. And so I think for some people, they find this career path. And I think it's a phenomenal career path. I obviously would love to see more women and more diversity in it. I think it's kind of been a little bit of gatekeeping with the boys club of like, this is a great <laughs> career path. You make good money, you can have some flexibility have a lot of control. And so I just think it, a lot of women particularly don't go in, into it. And I think it can be such a great career path for women. The reasons I've read that women don't go into it is because some women believe you have to be really strong with math. And I'm always just like, we use calculators and it's not complex math. Yeah. So what's you your don't. take on that? I 100% agree with you. I recently also brought on a new advisor and she's feeling a lot of stress about, you know, being in front of clients and not being able to know everything or be able to crunch the numbers or speak to the investment allocation. Ultimately, clients just, they want you to be smart enough, but ultimately they want to know that you care and that you have their best interests at, at heart. Mm -hmm. You know, just taking the time to really get to know them, get to the root of what it is that keeps them up at night. You know, a lot of my client conversations, sometimes I even forget. I'm like, oh, gosh, before you leave, we have to look at your performance reports or like actually talk about the asset allocation. You get to a point with clients where they're like, do your thing. You're doing a good job. All our goals are being met. And, you know, we just kind of check in sometimes just checking on family or their jobs, things like that. I agree. They say that um, the number one reason a client would leave an advisor, the number one reason is not performance at all, not related at all to the investments, but is related completely to the service of like not getting return phone calls, not being able to speak with their advisor, their advisor not understanding what their goals or needs are. The statistics have proven that clients leave because of a service-related issue, almost never because of a performance-related issue. Not to say that it's not important. I mean, if you're not holding that end of the stick... I yeah. think that rounds for, you know, because then ultimately you're not getting towards your goals, but yep. you don't have to hit it out of the ballpark, right? As long as you're hitting their, you know, target annualized rate of return and you're taking right. good care of them and also their families. Like we work with three generations of clients. That's pretty powerful. Yeah, no, that's incredibly powerful. I think the relationship is the, one of the best parts of this career path is that you really get to know people generationally, which is very rare. You don't see that in a lot of industries that you work with generation after generation. But I also think that one thing that was brought to my attention more recently with this career path sometimes isn't highlighted, which I think we should discuss is that while you have great income potential, and I think there's a lot of great aspects of the relationship and being client-facing, there is a lot of risk and liability with our industry. 
and a lot of exams. Usually, this is my saying is if you can make good money, usually they're, you know, it's a pro and con list that you give something up to be able to do that. I related a lot to the medical field that because you're working with individuals' money, like there's a lot of care that you need to take. And then as a result, also you have to be very careful. And there's a lot of rules and regulations that need to be followed. Yeah. I mean, I recently, a client sent me an email and she's kind of, um, she can be abrupt. So she sent me an abrupt email and I called her and I said, that email that you sent me is probably going to get flagged by my compliance department because it looks almost like a complaint. Like You're and unhappy. She's like, and she's like, what do you mean? Someone monitors your email? Absolutely. Absolutely. Someone monitors my email. Every single trade, every single email, anything and everything we post on social media, everything is reviewed by compliance department. I don't think people understand how under the microscope we are professionally and personally when it comes to everything that we do. I think you bring up a a keyword, personally. I've had uh, my sister who's who's an attorney, so she also has licensing. And, you know, I sat for the CFP, which is 10 hours. I think her bar was 12 hours. Same thing with the credentialing process. You have to upkeep it. But the big difference between us and other professions is they monitor your personal life. She said to me, what do you mean you can't do that? That's personal that's outside of work hours. And I was like, it doesn't matter if it's outside of work hours. It doesn't, everything that I do needs to be approved, including moving. Moving. If you purchase another house, if you start another business, if you get a real estate license, if you make a personal investment, if yeah, all of your accounts have to be reported, all of your holdings have to be reported. It's a lot. And so I think that at least on this podcast, I guess I've just always been in finance and institutional. I will say when I worked at an investment bank, It was a lot more lax, frankly, than personal. I think because with institutional, you're working with institutional clients and there's a bar that's assumed of knowledge base. And with retail, Mm -hmm. which is what we do working with individuals, they're not qualified, right, in terms of the government's perspective. And so there's just more oversight. And there's been a lot of issues with our industry, with bad people being in it. And so I think there's just more regulation that we're under from an institutional side. But I think that's the one thing I really haven't talked about a ton on the podcast, or at least with other advisors as well, is that there is so much oversight that all of your emails are monitored. Everything is monitored professionally. Everything is monitored personally. That comes in tandem with the great career path it is, but it's like being, I would I equate it to the medical field. Like if you're a doctor, you are also monitored and scrutinized and under we pay for E and O insurance the same yes, way. Same way. Any one of the medical facility, you know, and the medical field does. And yep. I think that's a little, again, a little known fact. It comes with the territory. The territory. I still think it's a super worthwhile career. I love that you brought up personal. I don't even think of it. And like sometimes it does happen where people who are just not familiar, like my sister, was like, "What do you mean?" you have to get a house purchase approved. It's like your house has nothing to do with your business. And I was like, but it's me. And I'm personally, I did that to, you for Barbara. Yeah. Update. You have to like update you for, I mean, I guess the only thing they don't check on is if you take a vacation, but yeah, all, everything else is pretty much monitored. I think it goes in line with the fact that it is a great career path, but you have to understand that there's a stringent regulation and, you know, is errors and omissions insurance, which is quite expensive. And you have to have that, which is why it can be a little bit harder to be on your own. Cause you have to cover all of those expenses, all the insurance and appliances. The you. fees alone of being an advisor, the state licensing fees, the CFP fees, the insurance, fees, all of the technology and things that we need to subscribe to, to be able to do our job, the overhead can be pretty high. Forget your physical office space or your staff or anything like that. It is quite high. I think not including all the exams that you have to take, if you just have to do E&O and technology setups and that's where I think it's around 12,000 a year. Yeah. Yep. Maybe a little bit more depending on state registrations and stuff. Just to be able to work. Yeah. To turn the lights on. And that light, those lights are, we haven't accounted for where those lights are. That's like not with rent or anything. That's just a computer somewhere that hasn't been approved yet by compliance. And I think that's one of the things too, like if I think about a barrier to entry for women, right? Especially as being an independent advisor, there isn't that guidance of how to grow and scale your business. That is something that, you know, personally I've struggled with. You know, I still have, you know, 20 plus years to go before I hit my retirement and something that I will probably continue to struggle with as I go through different iterations of what my business look like and what my team looks like. And I think for some people who don't have that kind of entrepreneurial Mm -hmm. grit, 
it's just easier to say, I don't want to deal with any of these things. I'm just going to go work for somebody else. Yeah, you're right. Because there is no roadmap, especially as a solo independent advisor. It's like up to you how you want to build and grow and what that looks like. And it looks different like any other business. Mm -hmm. that's run by an entrepreneur, you know, every restaurant doesn't look the same, right? You can do it multiple ways. Yeah, I agree. I think that is the hard part about getting going as an advisor, especially if you want to do it on your own. What does that look like? When do you need to make your hire? What does that hire cost? Where do you find the hire? There's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. We're making yeah. it sound really bad, Barbara. Really no, bad. I mean, I was going to say, well, I think the nice thing is that there's multiple paths, right? Like you don't have yeah. to own your own business and be an advisor. You can go and yeah. only be an advisor and work for somebody else. And they give you that guidance and that roadmap, or then you can build the roadmap yourself if you want to be more entrepreneurial. And I will say that for being a female, if you want to get into this, doing it your way, I think is very attractive. If you just, mm -hmm. you can build a really nice income and really ni nice client base, I think, as long as you have that foundation to do so and the licensing to do so, and you can build yourself a nice business. You don't have to make it huge, but you can make it a lifestyle mm -hmm. business. Like this is an industry that can be a lifestyle industry. So I have two boys, eight and six years old. And when they were younger, I was basically cruising. And when I was pregnant and I had two kids under two and, and all of that, I took my foot off the gas and I said, all I'm going to do is just take care of my existing clients. I'm not going to worry about growing my business or taking on new clients. And I had the flexibility or the option to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And then once they got a little older and I felt like, okay, what does this next kind of season look like for me? For me, that meant, you know, growing a team. And so I was able to kind of more full throttle and say, okay, we're going to give this, we're going to put the gas back and take on this next challenge. It can ebb and flow based on your needs, based on your family needs. It can really be designed for what you're looking for. That's what I think is really attractive about this is you could say, hey, right now for my lifestyle, I just want to manage my existing client book. And then you could say in three or four years or whatever, 10 years, hey, I really want to put the gas on. I want to bring on new clients and hire, which I think is really nice because I think the one thing that's very attractive about this career path, it can be recurring revenue depending on how you build it. Because I think right. women get sold on real estate a lot, right? Like flexible, unlimited income. But the part about it is it's not recurring. So like you work really hard one year doesn't mean you're going to have a good year next year. It's not recurring. And also it's nights and weekends. Yes, I know. I, and I don't like nights and weekends. I would not want to give up my nights and weekends for work. I'd rather work nine to five and, and have those nights and weekends. Actually the advisor in our office, she wanted to get into finance and got her real estate license and thought real estate was going to be the best fit for her. So she was doing real estate and working for me two days a week part-time. And she quickly was like, no, this isn't going to work for me. I don't want to leave my family dinner to go do an open house. I don't want to be doing showings on the weekends and or at nights. Like it just, it doesn't fit. And when you're selling a house, I feel like at least when I was buying houses, like it gets really intense, like right before you close of like calling and texting all the time. It didn't feel like there's like boundaries, right? Cause you're trying to close, you're trying to get the house. So like, there is no real boundaries. It's like, Oh, like this is what happened with the inspection or I called for this. And like, it just feels like a lot versus our industry where you're like business hours. This is yeah. when we do our meetings. Unfortunately, as women though, in our industry, a lot of us fall into support staff positions, marketing operations. Um, and I think a large part of it is because that from a statistical perspective, that's m more where those roles are. There's very, very few women business owners that you and I, for example, can look up to as role models and say, look, she did it. I can do it. Not a lot. Not a lot. Yeah. You're right. And, and when I quoted that 15 to 20%, and I feel like that's generous, that's for advisors. That is not for support staff, marketing, investment. It's the client facing role. And even less women of that percentage are CFPs. Yep. No, you're right. And then if you even broke it down to who own their own business, because that's another level of complexity. It's probably even less. Yeah. So we need more role models we need more? Yes. Yeah, for people like you or I, or anyone who wants to get into business to see them thriving so that we can feel like, you know what, if they did it, I can do it. Too. I can do it. I completely agree with you. And the great thing about the podcast is I feel like general personal finance education, financial literacy is like a good group of our listeners, but we also have a lot of women who listen, who are really interested in this career path. And mm -hmm. I do agree with you that there aren't enough role models. I also think it can be hard to get into for some of the reasons that you pointed out, like all the licensing and like the setup, not to say that it's impossible. It just, it is, can be a barrier to get into. I really kind of think, curious on your opinion, 
that like starting with a training program is a great way to get into it. And I did a training program, not in personal finance, but I still think learning fundamental client relationship building in a training Mm -hmm. program is like just really helpful before you sit in front of clients. But what do you think would be your best tip? Because there are some barriers to entry with this industry. Sometimes I'm torn between the traditional like companies that offer that training, because I do think a lot of that training is antiquated Mm -hmm. based on where we are now as a society and they teach you about marketing and developing COIs and and just some of it is to me feels just very outdated. It's Mm -hmm. not something if I were in that training that I would be like, really, that's what you want me to do. That's how I'm going to build my business. The industry itself has evolved, I would say a lot over the last five or 10 years. And there's been much more of a focus on planning as a whole. Mm -hmm. So I, one of the things I'm grateful to Ameriprise for is from the get-go, they instilled in me the importance of financial planning. So I've always, I've led with financial planning and I've I've never strayed away from that, but not every advisor has focused on financial planning. And it's really just been more about investment management, which is less about the human connection and building the relationship and more about the performance that we talked about earlier. And I think as women, where we shine is the human side of money, Mm -hmm. having that empathy, being able to connect with our clients, asking the right questions, really making them feel seen, valued Mm -hmm. and heard. I think the industry is working towards that. But unfortunately, a majority of our industry is still represented by white males over the age of 60 that still do it the old way. Which is leading with an investment foot. They're like stock jockeys is the way I would describe it. Really, those people were not advisors. They were brokers. They're just buying and stuff. I think it's going to take time, but I do see a light at the end of the tunnel. And it's a numbers game. We just need more younger women or any women really to kind of step into this role so we can be part of that wave of change. I agree. Yeah. And I do agree. Some of the training programs are still hard part about our industry is the world around us is changing and our industry doesn't change that quickly. A COVID really pushed us forward, but pre COVID, I mean, antiquated was like putting it lightly, putting it very lightly. Like we, (laughs) so everyone listening, like you would call a a vendor or company and they'd be like, please fax it. I'd be like, fax it. Can I scan it? Like, no, we don't accept scans. And this was like 2019. So very antiquated. Like paper account statements, like mailing checks in the mail, all that. Oh yeah. For the longest time we had to have physical checks. I was like, I don't have a physical check. You're like, well, we have to have a physical check. I'm like, no, we have like people have Venmo. Like (laughs) people don't have checks these days. So it's getting better. I I agree. Um, So why don't we, we switch it up a little. I'm curious to talk about what you think are the most important parts of personal finance for women. That's obviously we have a very specific demographic. I'm all about Mm -hmm. educating women on financial literacy. So what do you think are like the most important things for women to know? Well, I just want to say nothing bad happens when women have money. (laughs) I agree. Okay. Yeah. Like we don't become any less feminine. Have money, be proud, like have that financial stability, have that Mm -hmm. confidence. You are a hundred percent worthy of all of it. Okay. So I think there's like this stigma that as women, it's bad to have money. It's bad to talk about money. No, even with each other, like as friends, as men do a better job, they talk about that. They help each other get promotions as Mm -hmm. women where, oh, we shouldn't talk about that. Or it's rude if I ask, or maybe I'll cross a line. And unfortunately, I think that's one of the reasons why we are held back. Mm -hmm. uh, Part of the issue with the income inequality that we're experiencing. So I just want to say that. I think that's like a a mantra that as women that we should hold on to. Nothing bad happens when we have money. I really agree. And I do think that it's really interesting that men, as they advance in their careers, talk about the raises, the bonuses, the benefit, like very candidly and openly. If anything, they overstate Mm -hmm. And then women will talk about everything except that. Like that's very faux pas to talk about it. I mean, I think things are getting better with some of the new rules around salary transparency. I think that's beneficial. But yeah, if you don't know, you can't help each other. And I think it's important to disclose and be truthful, not with everybody, right? But like you should have a group of people that you feel comfortable and can trust and you can give each other advice on those sort of things. Yeah. I think as women, we just keep it very lighthearted. I actually, I had a dinner, I don't know, recently, and I was telling my husband, I was like, I came home and 
I was kind of like just disappointed. I was like, I just feel like as when I get together with the girls, it's just very lighthearted and like surface level. I'm kind of disappointed. Like I want to get into like deeper conversations and like I, I feel frustrated. He brought up a good point and he's like, You're used to having these conversations day in and day out with your clients. Yep. And you're looking for that, whereas most people are not. So for them, it's not lacking. But for you, it is because you you get to that that level, that deepness. Mm-hmm. You do it yeah. quickly, right? Because like we sit yeah. in a meeting, we have to know what's going on in your finances to have the meeting be productive. Yeah. For me, I'm very aware of it just with my own set of friends. And then I think the other thing women should know about money, I would think I'm, this is like a little uh, pit for ourselves, the shameless plug here, but having and hiring a financial advisor is really important. I can't tell you the number of my clients that say, I wish I had started working with you sooner. And in fact, I would challenge you to tell you that it's a form of self-care. You know, that's a great question. And this was something that one of our listeners asked. We did like a little bit of like a small podcast on it, but I would be curious your opinion. When do you think you should hire a financial advisor? Like at what point do you think you're ready to make that investment? And when you have discretionary income. Oh, that's a really easy, simple answer. Again, for me, like when I work with clients, I don't, I don't have an asset minimum because I would rather be the person that helps you become a millionaire than, than tell you come back to me when you are a millionaire. I use that discretionary income because you have money that you can use towards your goals. And I think a lot of times what happens is if you wait, five years or however long to have a certain amount of money saved up. During the course of that time, you're getting a lot of bad advice from friends, from family, from TikTok, from from other forms of social media. Uh, Some of those mistakes can be avoided and actually put you at an advantage in terms of your future financial potential. You know, the discretionary income, now that you say it seems so simple. And I was like, in my head, I was like trying to figure it out um, because I think it's a little different for everyone, but that's a really clear point. And that for most people would be like when you get through, if you have like some pretty overwhelming credit card debt or student loan debt where you don't have that extra income, but once you have extra income and you're allocating it towards various goals, like saying, okay, this is a goal of mine to improve my finances. How I think about it is if they're living paycheck to paycheck, there's not a lot of value I can provide Mm -hmm. as an advisor, right? Mm -hmm. But if they've taken of some of those or they have discretionary income because a lot of clients are like, you know, I make good money or I have discretionary income. I just, I don't know what to do with it. Right. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of information at our fingertips and and most clients are smart enough to read and understand, but where they get stuck is how do I take the information that I just read? Do I do the the brokerage account? Do I want ETFs? Do I want individual stocks? Do I want mutual funds? They can't get to that next level, which means that they don't actually end up taking action. That lack of taking action is ultimately what prohibits them from getting ahead. Yeah, that makes total sense. And it is, it's really easy to read an article that explains to you what a Roth is, why it's valuable, but like, how do you know that's the right one for you in this scenario? It's that application of the knowledge is very different. Anybody can read it, but applying it to your own life and your own circumstances is the difficult part. Well, amazing. Um, okay. And then what about your favorite financial resources? Do you have like a go-to book or podcast that people always ask, like, if I wanted to get started, like, what should I be doing on my own? Yeah. So unfortunately, a lot of the podcasts I listen to are specific to advisors. So uh... Okay. I, I was waiting for you to say murder. <laughs> no, no. I, I don't watch those on TV either. So, <laughs> but my favorite book that I recommend to everybody and I've given away, we always have copies here in our office, is The Psychology of Money by okay. Morgan Housel. And the reason why I love it is it's a finance book, but it's not a finance book. It's okay. a bunch of short stories about other people who have made good and bad decisions and kind of the psychology behind that. So it's really easy to read. It's really digestible. Um, and I've gotten a lot of really great feedback from clients who have read it. So that would be my number one recommendation. Amazing. Well, yeah. thank you so much for coming on. This was awesome. Thank you for having me. I um, love we'll- to talk about the industry and, and I love to encourage more women to, to get into it. <laughs>